Flying Coach is back for a second season, Peter Schrager and Rams head coach Sean McVay are joined by guests from around the sports and entertainment world. They're discussing the latest NFL news, telling stories from their careers, and breaking down games from their unique perspectives. Check out Flying Coach Season 2 on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July. I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023. I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible. Thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your life. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. From your morning podcast to your afternoon playlist, State Farm knows you personalize your entire day. And that's why State Farm helps you personalize your insurance with the State Farm Personal Price Plan. It offers coverage options that help protect what you care about most at an affordable price just for you. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Prices vary by state. Options selected by customer. Availability and eligibility may vary. I need sports to have to clear the room. Stand up and walk now. Hello and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan. I am an editor at TheRinger.com and joining me on the other line... He knows the muscles at Cafe Stella just hit him different. It's Andy Greenwald. That's a deep cut, my brother. That's a deep. If you if you know, if you know, then you know. It's Sunset Junction talk. <laughs> it's like deep first season hacks in jokes. What's going on? It's Monday. I just got done doing a locker room about the Euros. I'm pumped. I'm pumped and jacked. Let's go, Greenwald. I love it too because. I really appreciate this is why you're a professional, because I think you're Chris, you're very responsive to the the notes we get. And I think one of the main notes we got recently was that our show is too broad. You know what I mean? Like we target it yeah. to just like Joe Sixpack. No, it's mass and his interests. Yeah. You know, and so what will name or mean off, for Black Panther? That's just like how we lead every podcast off. Yeah. So instead, allowing me to to tell a story to our listeners about how when Ava on Hacks arrived at Cafe Stella near Intelligentsia <laughs> Coffee, near both of our homes, I reacted with the Leo and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood <laughs> meme, but I didn't even post it. I, I think I texted you a yes, meme, and now I get did. to tell our podcast that. So this is how we keep the listenership week <laughs> to week to week on Hollywood's most consistent There is never podcast. a drop-off. It's just... Mm. Just every it just always stays the same no matter what. Uh, Andy, we have a couple of things we want to get to. So we are going to talk about hacks today, as promised. Uh, I wanted to hit a couple of headlines for you though, because uh, there was. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I got. I, I I actually I did want to hit you with one thing. They're headlines. We're going to talk about some news, but I did want to bring something to your attention and just kind of get your your thoughts on it, if you don't mind. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is a dispatch from Daddington Island, which has been the seas were high on the island this weekend. Anyone receiving the Leo meme text for me knows that I've been solo dadding for a bunch of days now, which is actually has been great. But it did remind me this weekend, I don't know if you saw this in the New York Times, but there was an article about an island off the coast of Spain where like six people live in the off season oh. <laughs> and then in the summer. And I was like, that's Daddington Island, honestly, right now. Sure. But, you know, as anyone who is a parent or has ever babysat knows, like the, the dawn of the streaming age has been a boon and has been a godsend because... You know, we had a, a big day out in the hot, hot Southern California sun yesterday. And then there was like a like a 90 minute window where your guy had to like attend to the laundering and the dishes and the dinner making and stuff. And I was like, sweet, sweet grandpa Netflix. <laughs> let's do this. And kids, the benefit, have you thought about binging all of Gangs of London? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we can watch better. Gamora dubbed or in its Italian. <laughs> They're purists. Yeah they, love, yeah, they love the subtitles. I mean. Again, one of the benefits and people who have children are probably nodding their heads of having an older child is that like they can operate the remotes and something and you can you can figure it out. But and they're also really on top of what's going on in the Netflix kids queue, you know, and so that's fine with me. And my older daughter was like, there's a new movie that I want to watch. Um, 
just came out. I was like, I'm sure there is. And the answer is it's a it's a you're pre-approved. You know what I mean? I'm basically a banking loan officer uh, during the last year. Sure. Interest rates low. Yes. No problem. And I don't want to, 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 to smear anything. This actually this movie actually seemed quite entertaining and they and they really enjoyed it. But it is there's a there's a moment. Right. So they watched this movie called Wish Dragon, which is like okay. a Jackie Chan produced uh, Chinese cartoon great voice cast john cho plays a dragon it actually seemed really good his he did a great job my kids really loved it i think somebody uh once offered me wish dragon in washington square park in the early 2000s (laughs) statute uh, of limitations is still going maybe maybe we can fold that anecdote into our coverage of betty season two i think it's relevant um no it's just that have, you've heard about, we've all heard about the people who are just like watches YouTube video once and the next thing you know, they're storming the Capitol. Like, sure. I do think like our most dangerous and vulnerable spot as a society is the kids section of Netflix. I am not <laughs> casting aspersions on the makers of this film, which was actually quite good. I want to reiterate that. What I am saying is if any nation that wishes to do war with the future of America just buys an animation studio, (laughs) you could have the, this entire generation in the palm of your hands. There will not be another red dawn. We won't, we won't be fighting back. Yeah. No, they will be the ones waking up in the night to unlock the doors. You understand what I mean? Like we are, this is, I'm no cyber, cyber security guy shouts to big picture, super fan, Sam, Sam Esmail, but like, we need a patch, is what I'm saying. Okay? <laughs> yeah. We need something because this time was okay. Because my children were like, that was fun and a little bit sad. And I was like, sad because democracy is a failed idea? And they were like, no, sad because the person's mom died. I'm like, oh, okay, great. As long as it wasn't a dad and as long as you weren't attacking our American ideals, great. Do you get what I'm going with this? I do. I, I, I hear okay. you, man. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny you, should, you, you mentioned streaming services. Both of my headlines involve streaming services. And I think I'll start... Great. Let's start with the uh, quote unquote underperformance of yes, In the Heights wanna, in the box office because I know you wanted to chat about this. So, In the Heights, the uh, John Chu adaptation of the Lin Manuel Miranda musical from, I can't remember, was that 08? When did that come out? A while back. That, yeah. 06, 08 in there, yeah. Yeah, and uh, it was, you know, supposed to, long delayed because of, um, obviously, like, the COVID theatrical release issues and then has been hugely pushed. Like, I think you would really have to be, you would have to be blind not to have seen In the Heights promo going on during the NBA playoffs, during billboards when you're driving around. This was a big Warner movie release and it made around $11 million at the box office this weekend while movies like Conjuring 3 and Quiet Place continue to do quite well. And I think that the takeaway from its performance initially was that HBO Max, its simultaneous release on HBO Max, had somehow cannibalized its box office returns. Now, The that curse did not, of Killar. It did not actually... That did not seem to impact Godzilla uh, versus King Kong when that came out. But I'll read you a quote. So this is from Warner Media, president of domestic distribution. This is from a variety piece on this whole matter. And it's Jeff Goldstein. And he said, our experience, which is backed up on In the Heights, is that if the movie hits a high level in theaters, it hits a high level on the service, meaning HBO Max. If it hits a low level in theaters, it hits a low level on HBO Max. They're really very comparable. So what Jeffrey Goldstein seems to be suggesting is that not only do people not go to the movies to watch In the Heights, that it underperformed on the service. This was also reiterated just within the last hour or two by one of these. I mean, there are all these services that keep offering their opinions or their analysis of streaming data. I mean, I'm sure you probably get these unsolicited emails too. I I don't know where they, how how or where they do this or how accurate they are, but there was a report saying that it was underperforming on HBO Max as well. So I heard this news and I, I want to preface this by saying I have not watched In the Heights yet. Uh, We are actually, after our great experience, well, three-fourths of our great experience watching Spirit Untamed in the theater Uh last week, I would like to go see, we're going to watch In the Heights in the theater. We're going to go to a theater. For two and a half hours. Okay, I'm going to circle back on that. That's news. (laughs) Did you you know that that was the runtime? Huh. No, that's, okay. All right. So this is uh, breaking news. Well, I mentioned it because that may have something to do with the engagement. Well, okay. So I do want to talk about this. So I saw all the headlines like being like, oh, this is hugely underwhelming. It's a bomb. It's this or it's that. 
I, I've became very frustrated. I have not seen this film. I actually have not really engaged even with the musical. I'm 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 kind of a pure Hamilton guy, but that could change. But this just feels to me like an incredibly wrong-headed framing on a number of levels. And I kind of want to go through it. I think the number one thing, and this is this is a criticism I've seen lobbied at Warner Brothers, and I think it's best to just remove the criticism and just take it, I think honestly, as a fact, which is in the heights is not a known property. Mm-hmm. It's not famous. I mean, yes, it's famous. In, on the Upper West Side, I mean, it's famous in the theater-going and loving community of New York and maybe in the extended diaspora of Hamilton super fandom, mm-hmm. but this is not a famous property. It does not have famous actors in it. Anthony Ramos could well become a very famous actor and leading man and has, has, you know, has done the round of press recently to support that. There are no famous stars in it. None of the songs, as far as I know, are on the charts or have broken through in any meaningful way. This is an incredibly hard sell as a movie. And Warner Brothers' full-throated support of it and belief in it is great. And I feel like it's worth just for a moment saying, good. That's good for everyone in the industry if Warner Brothers is treating something like this, that w- something that is, to all accounts, fantastic. I mean, it's gotten rave reviews. I recommend people read Tony Scott's review of it in the New York Times if you haven't already. It's really a strong, it's a great review and it makes me even more you, excited you to love, see the movie. You love a Tony Scott rave. That's you one thing about you. Rave. I do. <laughs> I know. I do. Finger on the pulse, Greenwald. I know, right? Uh, loves Tony Scott. Dislikes Remember the Conjuring series. Remember when we got series. into like a mild argument about his Manchester by the Sea review on the podcast or, in, or no? IRL? I think in real life. I think we were. Like, I was like, I didn't care for that. You were just like another banger from Tony. Yeah, I ride for Tony. <laughs> I'm Scott Hive all the way. Um, I felt. I felt at the time that was because I think I still. Oh no, I was going to say I thought it was because I lived in New York and I had to ride for my local. Critic for the New York Times, but you were, oh, more, right. of a Manolo, you were more of a Manola man. Manola, yeah, right. But uh, anyway, all, all of this is to say, like, this is this was never going to have the box office allure that a Godzilla movie is. It's just not a pre-sold property. So there's there's that. The second thing is the it was on streaming too, which is an argument that I think we don't really understand enough to litigate yet. As you said, it maybe it, a rising tide seems to lift all boats. People want to see something, they see it, and and one doesn't necessarily cannibalize the other, which I jokingly shouted out Sam a moment ago, but that's something he said on our podcast um, in the past. Something that I think is also underreported in this, and this might be, you know, this feels a little bit like socio-cultural phrenology. The whole attitude was like, this is underperforming at the box office because A Quiet Place did well. Well, A Quiet Place did well because it's a horror movie and it's a sequel and it's also like a let's all go to the movies and shout together kind of thing. Sure. It is also... Look, I think In the Heights could succeed in a 50-state strategy, but Quiet Place is definitely making boku bucks in places where movie theaters have been open nonstop for the last year and a half, right? For sure, and yeah. And again, small sample size, but my parents in our wonderful hometown of Philadelphia went to a theater to see In the Heights. They went to like the Prince Theater, like big fancy theater downtown Philadelphia Went early because they were sure that this hit movie that got a rave review from their fave, Tony Scott, was going to be sold out. Five people in the theater. Five people in the theater. I that, think... Granted, that, that the might Heights have been the 11 a.m. That it, it was the 8.30 a.m. <laughs> yeah, champagne <laughs> breakfast special. My point is, and I, don't, I haven't seen this covered, I don't know if the In the Heights audience is ready to go back to normal yet and go back to theaters. I My only note on this is that I, I watched a bunch of it on Max this weekend, just like kind of, which is sort of you're, my you're the problem well no yeah. i mean if if it's like 2.5 hours and like which check some of it out and then i'll check some more of it out i'm i'm sure that like i'm i am part of the problem but i am also obviously logging mad hours on mac so like i'm, I'm fair, actually fair. contributing to their bottom line in some way i would just say that you know they they apparently chose to put this movie out as a summer blockbuster because the setting of the film obviously is is like it's supposed to be just like a summertime extravaganza, and that they were hoping people would come out of the movie theater, um, sort of ecstatic with feelings of of summer and music in the air and all this stuff. And I totally understand that, but I wonder whether or not this might have been served better as like a fall winter kind of award season push, because it's like it, I think generally speaking, summer has become the playground of amusement park rides. Like you want to go see Godzilla. Absolutely. You want to go see a movie where nobody talks until they scream. You want to go see the devil coming out of some kid. You don't want to maybe necessarily <laughs> Excuse see. Excuse me? No, I mean, that's run, what Conjuring run that is. One back? Yeah, Conjuring. Oh. Yeah, no, that's Come just, 
<laughs> no, and so I think I wonder whether or not in retrospect, maybe you don't want to hold it for that much longer, but would be would a November in the Heights release have fared better? Maybe. I think that's a fair point. I just don't understand the framing, to be honest with you, because we just went through this tumultuous year where all, all, the, all, all the old rules were thrown out. And now we're in this brave new age where not just it's not just that profits could come from many sources and we don't actually know what's valuable to a company anymore. It's not just about the box office bottom line. So then why, given that, are we still like, oh, 10 million the first weekend? It's a goner. It's dead. Stick forks in it. Why are we still doing that? I mean, I know this is maybe the oldest thing I'll say, uh, hopefully the oldest man thing I'll say in this podcast. But like, Chris, you and I are, are old enough to still remember vaguely a time when movies could grow slowly and yes. that there could be a word of mouth movie or, you know, something that would maybe never reach number one at the box office, but be number three, number four and hang around for an entire summer and then become a beloved classic. And I kind of don't understand the rush to bury this movie outside of grievances with the studio or with its release strategy. You know, it 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 seems to be a successful film on the merits. It's streaming. It's in theaters as, you know, L.A. is officially reopening, whatever, you know, whatever that may end, whatever that ends up meaning for us tomorrow, maybe more people will go to the theater next week and the next week. And so can we begin to get out of this do or die in one weekend? I, I think that there's another chapter of this one, because like you just said, um, you know, maybe we're, we're taking too limited a view of like, if you didn't do it your first week, you might as well have never put the movie out anyway. Right. You know, as the father of kids who knew Hamilton back and forth before they ever saw it, that musicals uh, sort of thrive on repetition, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Like musicals thrive on people getting to know the songs, deciding which is their favorite song, deciding mm -hmm. which is their favorite part. If this movie is available on Max immediately and word of mouth grows and you start to see a little bit more of a social aspect to watching it, you know, Oh, like I we we watch in the heights and my kids loved it so much, or I loved it so much, or my my girlfriend loved it so much. Like we'll go through it again and again and again. We'll have it on. Maybe we'll put on just this part. I bet there's a second life to this one. So I, I, I think I it's totally interesting agree. that the, that Jeff Goldstein came out and said this movie was flat across the board on both services. Like nobody nobody made him say that. But uh, we'll see what we'll see what happens with it in the future. It just. I, yeah, I just agree with you. I just, I, it's a bummer if we're going to come out of this transformational and challenging year and just do the same shit to the same yeah. things, you know. And I say this without a without a particular horse in the fight. I mean, horse in the fight, horse fight. I'm doing great today. Horse guys. in the race. That's right. <laughs> horse in the race. Dog in the fight. I haven't seen the movie yet, but I, I, I wish that we could redefine what success means in the way that we talk about things, especially movies. Before we get on to other stuff, I want to ask you: Did you happen to see the morning show season two trailer? You know, you asked me to. Yeah. And I definitely was like, that's a great idea for our podcast. It doesn't but I matter. I can't look you in the face and lie. I can't it, do it. It almost works better if you haven't, because I'll okay, tell great. you this. Thank you. Thank you. Morning show's coming back, I believe, this great. summer at some point. And, you know, this was a show that I actually enjoyed quite a bit. I know it was an object of uh, some jokes when it came out. You know, it, it, it was a very stirring depiction of a moment where, you know, the Me Too, contra uh, like, sort of controversy taking over the media industry. I thought it had some really, really great moments. But I'm happy to report that the makers of Morning Show seem to have realized what you and I knew all along, which is that if you've got Billy Crudup in the kitchen, yeah. let him cook. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so he is, I like, mean... the main engine of this trailer. It's just Crudup walk and, t walk and talks. Now I want to watch it. I wish that I had done that. The dude won an Emmy for this part. <laughs> you know? I mean, he snatched the whole bag from this show. And obviously, it's going to get headlines because of its big stars. But that guy's sneaky, man. That's exciting. Uh, the only other things I'll mention is that Greta Lee is in this show now, which is good uh, from, from Russian Doll. And that uh, I still want to know what... Steve Carell thought he was signing up for versus what he's doing and whether or not like that's cool because it just does seem like he is getting paid the the whole entire bag just to sit on a couch and be a miserable Matt Lauer stand in but like doesn't really ever live leave this like one set in Brentwood or wherever he's shooting this I mean Chris I you you just answered your own question I believe that what he signed up for was at a minimum of seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars per episode, <laughs> he I, I I see no confusion about what he signed up for. No, there's no uh, downside to this. 
Why don't we take a quick break? We'll come back and we're going to dive into the first season of Hacks, which concluded uh, just this last week. This episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. New Year's resolutions are fun the first couple of weeks. Then you kind of maybe conveniently forget about them halfway through January. No shame. It happens to us all. But this year, I have a foolproof plan, at least when it comes to saving money. Just switch to Mint Mobile and you're done. Goal accomplished. Because for a limited time, their wireless plans are 15 bucks a month when you buy a three-month plan. The great thing about Mint Mobile is there's no jaw-dropping monthly bills or unexpected overages, and all plans come with unlimited talk and text. Get this new customer offer today at mintmobile.com slash watch. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. All right, Andy, we are back to talk about, I would say, probably one of our favorite shows of the year, right? Absolutely. Without question. I struggle to remember another show that made the leap within its first season, like inside of its first season like this. I'm sure I, I, if I thought about it a little harder, I could think of something. But the I, I liked Hacks when it first started. I thought it was really funny. We really excited. Sweet show. It was very, you know, completely in, like really enjoyable. And then around episode five, uh, I think the episode is called Falling. It's when uh, the Ava character uh, meets, a, meets a guy on the casino floor and spends the the evening with him in a drug fueled kind of therapy sesh hookup sesh um and then he meets we'll, we'll actually be spoiling hacks if you haven't watched it so so then he commits suicide so after that the season itself kind of goes on this three episode run of yeah. plumbing like kind of depths of of these characters and finding pathos and finding kind of layers of you know i thought really like emotional depth that I didn't really think that they were going to be aiming for. And then you wind up with this enormously satisfying uh, finale. And I really, it's not like I have no notes. I mean, there's some stuff that I think, you know, I would have like been more curious about this, that, or the other thing. But what a beautifully, like fully formed show. What an incredible, another incredible stage to see the brilliance of Gene Smart. And just what a, yeah, what an accomplishment. Yeah, I was just totally dazzled by the show. And I think that you hit the nail on the head when you talked about a show taking the leap. Um, a, a great a great man and one of Hack's executive producers, Mike Schur, once told me that he wishes all comedies were able to um, make their first five or so episodes in a vacuum and throw them out. And the first episode anyone ever saw would be the sixth because that's generally how much time it takes. I think he actually even said 10 at the time. And I think he was talking about first 10 episodes. I think we were right. talking about the more the broadcast network model. But I think what he was saying was it takes that long for everybody to figure out their voice, whether it's the writers or it's the actors figuring out their characters. But comedies, successful TV comedies are, I don't, I don't want to play percentages, but a, a very high percentage of them is, is simply chemistry. And between the characters, between the actors and the parts, between the writers and the people they're writing for. And it takes time. It takes time. And what's so incredible about this first season of Hacks was those first five or six episodes reminds me of the 20 minute scene in every Marvel or superhero movie where the person figures it realizes they have powers mm -hmm. and they just start laughing because, oh, my God, I can fly now or whatever. That's what happens during that episode four or five. And, you, and, and for me, it was six. actually. Yeah, that's new and, eyes, right? That's the one yes. where she goes to the plastic surgery recovery center. Yeah, that's the one where I was like, because 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 falling definitely is like the, the rocket boost that pushes it out of the atmosphere. And then all of a sudden they're able to sustain. It's thrilling. Suddenly you look around at this, this bench of performers and you're like, wait, I want to be with all of these people right now. It's not right. just, as you said, Gene Smart giving yet another in a remarkable series of absolutely peerless performances or, or Hannah Einbinder, who we should talk about, who's a newcomer as Ava, who is a really fascinating, interesting, and surprising performer in her own right. But suddenly, Carl Clemens Hopkins as Marcus, who's been in the background, like, oh, I, I really care about what he's up to, or Caitlin Olsen, or Christopher McDonald, or Poppy Lou is Kiki, the blackjack dealer, who's just mm -hmm. like, now I want her in every scene, even if it's just a cut to once. All the things that you need for a successful comedy, in my view, you know, in terms of a, like just a, a, an incredible collection of talent that you just want to be with and spend time with. And you can just imagine in a good way, all of the up and coming writers being like, I want to write a hack spec because I want to write for these clearly defined voices in my, in, and show what I can do with them. But then because this is a HBO max show or it's a 2021 type of series, there is this 
element of pathos and humanity to it that only got stronger and more confident as the season went on and made me even more excited about a second season than I think I was about the first. Yeah, you know, uh, let's talk a little bit about the Ava and Deborah characters because, you know, I we, we've I, we've talked a lot over the last couple of years about whether or not characters get viewed unfairly as the statement that the creators of the show want to make about the society or the world. So if a character does something bad, that somehow the writers of the show think that that's a good, like what they did is somehow justified. And, you know, I think that that line between fiction and what we think is, we, what we see represented on screen, whether or not there can be this remove between like the author writing something for a character that is maybe ugly or, or unfunny or anything you want to say. And what I really loved about Hacks was they had it both ways. You know what I mean? Like there was essentially this season long debate about comedy, about accountability, about authenticity, about all these different things, creativity throughout this season. And you could kind of find yourself swaying back and forth between the Hannah and Deborah characters within the same conversation. And that makes it feel like these people are actually real. Yeah, it feels incredibly alive to the moment without ever feeling heavy handed. You know, it doesn't feel reactive yeah. to our like present Like it didn't moment. feel like Hannah was there to show Deborah what of her attitudes were retrograde. Like what if her ideas were like kind of... And it's not too overly protective of Deborah. I mean, obviously, look, the, the show's lens exactly. Exactly. is in awe of Gene Smart as it should be and giving her a showcase to win. The, the thrust of the season, by and large, is about peeling back the layers of, <laughs> chemically peeling back the Botox layers of uh, artifice and makeup and professionalism that, you know, that, that keep Ava from seeing what Deborah really is and forcing her to, you know, appreciate the work ethic, the struggles of being a, a woman in a, in a very different pre third or fourth wave feminist time. There's no question that we are, that the show loves her and is respectful of her. But at the same time, it's not too protective of her because it, it, goes right at her her flaws, her mm -hmm. vanity, her questionable parenting skills, her priorities, all of that. You know, this is something I'd love to get into with the show's creators because there is a marketplace for, for a show that is much more overt, a marketplace in terms of buyers. I'm not saying necessarily an audience. But if you say like, I'm going to tell the show, I'm going to make a show that's directly inspired by the battle over inflammatory tweets and wokeness and is comedy funny anymore or whatever. Like you could probably get at least a development deal or a script order off of that pitch. This show does what all good shows and what good art does, which is, yeah, that we're folding that in to the mix. That's there. But we're going to tell a show about these two particular women at this, two part at this particular moment, not just in our time collectively, but in their lives. And that's always going to be more compelling just on a narrative basis. Yeah, there's a great moment in 1.69 million, uh, which is an episode where Deborah is gone uh, is going up to Sacramento to try out some of her new material. She takes Ava along with her and they're talking behind backstage uh, before her show after what has been a very a day full of reminiscing for Deborah about like what it used to be like to tour these kind of places in in the 70s and 80s and uh, she's talking about the guy who used to run the the nightclub and how he was like a you know serial sexual harasser, but it was just part of the price of of what you had to do to get on stage in the first place. And Ava kind of is saying, well, if you had called him out, if you would press charges, if you had done something, think about all the other women that he's harassed who didn't make it because of what he did that you could have helped or saved or whatever. And that argument is, it definitely feels like you're reading like two op-ed columns sitting next to one another. But somehow it doesn't feel that way. You know what I mean? Like the actual the actual argument is something that I think you would see in any kind of like crossfire debate. But it really did feel authentic to the characters who were sitting in the room. The special issue of Atlanta, Caitlin Flanagan v. Gia Tolentino that I just pit <laughs> that I pitched is not gonna it's not gonna fly with you anymore after this episode. I know. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I I agree with you. I also want to the thing about Gene, the Gene Smart thing. I've been spending the last few days just trying to think about if I was still writing, how I would even talk about this performance because, and it just reduces me to just this kind of gibbering base level of like, it's, it's godlike as a, what she's able to do as a performer. And 
the only thing that I can say about it is contrary to most performers that I like and admire, and maybe you can help me, I, you might agree with me on this. There's a type of performer who is just an exposed raw nerve and you could, they are alive in the moment to a degree that almost feels intimate or invasive to be watching them. And you just don't know what's going to happen next, but you are just riveted, right? Because mm -hmm. it's, it, it's so intimate and their presence is so honestly superhuman because that's one of the hardest things for anyone to be is present in their real life, let alone in a performed, you know, for the acting for the screen. And then there's another type of performer who we also have a lot of time for. And there are many examples of whom we rave about who are having fun you know, who, who swagger and swing and are doing the job. And that's not saying they're not good actors. You know, part of the job is charisma. Part of the job is being a star to a degree, you know, whether you actually are a super famous person or not. And Jean Smart is one of the rarest performers because she combines the two. Yeah. She seems like she's having a ball. She seems like she loves acting. Not Deborah's having a ball, because some, although sometimes she is. But Jean Smart just radiates this kind of like professional joy that like she loves going to work and doing this and she's it's a it's a great gig but then also is so electric with her emotions and her listening and her presence that i buy her as a stand up comedian i mean that's hard i mean no one will tell you it's as hard as a stand up comedian will tell you you know to see an actor pretend to be a stand up or whatever but god like she just she carries herself like exactly like Deborah is in every scene in every scene I believe that this is a woman who has lived this life and is capable of these things that are exceptional and these other things that are kind of reprehensible all at once yeah you know I, I think that the show makes a really 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 smart decision to show as little comedy as possible like there is yeah, some that's also smart but you're right. just the same way that if you're going to make a movie about a painter or a movie about a writer or a movie, movie or about a, a musician rock band my god if you yeah. if you're making a movie about a musician and you don't have that thing you do just have them play covers and don't show them ever like writing a song because it's going to be so hard to convince the audience that this person has a number one hit or made, uh, yeah, you know, point. something like that's Nirvana's Nevermind if you don't have it. So I think that they get away with a lot by having Deborah kind of be in this twilight where she's running back the same material over and over again because the point of the jokes is that they are hacky or that they are stale, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that the... Ava character's sense of humor, so to speak, <laughs> is supposed to be slightly confrontational and like without personality because it's more just like it's more it's it's like they are like tweets. You know what I mean? They're they're, they're kind of like refined Twitter comedy. If you, does that well, make right, sense? Well, yeah, but it's also like my personal pain is the bit right. And Deborah's mm -hmm. at one point is like, wh why? Where's what their you punchline? Gone? Right. Okay, so one more question for you or for us collectively, and then and then one, it's not really a nitpick, I guess one one thing to flag going forward with the show. The, the main thing to say is it's so good that it's going forward. I can't believe there was ever a question. This must have been one of the easiest things that watch superfan Casey Bloys has ever had to do is to renew the show. Hannah Einbinder. So mm -hmm. stand-up comedian, young performer, daughter of Saturday Night Live original cast member Lorraine Newman, really grew on me over the course of the season, capable of playing all the parts of this not easy character, I would say, yeah. who has to be very, her, her sort of public facing brand, you know, is that she's kind of unbearable at times. Yeah. And to play someone who is self-obsessed, but also on some level decent as she needs to be to be a, you know, winning protagonist on the show is, is no small thing. I, I the, a question that I guess I can direct it to the, to the creators, um, Paul Downs and uh, Lucia and Yellow and Jen Statsky, but I'll just put it to you. They could have chosen any type of person to pair with a Deborah type, right? And so choosing, making Ava the way she is was a choice. And I think ultimately it was one that worked for me. I was wondering how you felt and how your relationship with the character developed over the course of the season. I, I just think that they never let her off easy, which is why it works. Because I think that if they had just sort of made the show where Ava is unquestionably, it's like Ava's struggle to get Deborah to see how wrong she is. So that would have been like, I think, a, a much less rewarding experience. You know, you, you have equal amounts of Ava is completely certain about like at least her moral outlook on the world and like the way the world is unfair to her. And she is not necessarily having like, I think that they do just enough look in the mirror to, the, to their characters that it never feels like one character is somehow getting over on the other or over on the audience. 
I do think that in the beginning of the season, I was like, this is pretty good, but like, they, I hope that they find a new gear for both of these people yeah. soon. I think that the one thing I was going to redirect to your way about like questions we had about the season, and I think we chatted a little bit about this in, in our text message, which we should probably just like publish that as like Siri can read them and then we can not have to do the pod. Let's just do a FOIA request. Let's let people do this. <laughs> Is um, the speed with which it burned through some plot, which yeah. I think we've been talking about a lot with a lot of different writers and showrunners for a lot of different kinds of shows from Falcon and Winter Soldier to, to other, you know, like a lot of different kinds of people thinking about this how much do I want to keep for this season? We talked about it with Eric Rochant about mm -hmm. the Bureau. It's like, how much am I thinking about multi-season plan? They pretty much end this season with, here's going to be the main tension is when will Deborah find out that Ava put out, like that she sent out like this gossipy email to these showrunners for their, for their prime minister show. And then also puts the show on the road and leaves behind what I thought was maybe also it's secret third best asset, which was Vegas and yes. the mundane banal like sort of soul crushing elements of Vegas but also like the opulence of of Deborah's life like all these little corners that they would find and like the in jokes like it was just really 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 sharp about that it's a small detail but there's a scene later in the season when Marcus and Wilson are having lunch and it's the one where I think they agree to they talk about toe shoes and agree to go camping but they're eating like nachos or at least chips, chips and guacamole on like an outdoor food court at the Bellagio or something. And yeah. it's so, such a great moment. And you First of all, of setting. no one can do that. It's 115 degrees yeah. out. Like you can't- joke about the heat. Your salsa um, would be boiling. Yeah. But it's, it's, your gazpacho would actually be a cup of Campbell's. But they, it, it's just like, that's where you would have lunch. You know what I mean? I, there's, there's just something that is so specific to it. It's both faceless, but highly specific. And it feels like that, place where everyone is on the make or grinding in a very specific, a very sp specifically flashy kind of way. Similarly, like when Ava knows all the back doors and stairways at the Palmetto and knows how to do the shortcuts. And it's just, it's just the way that place is for the people who have to wake up there every day, not with a story, but with something to do. And I, I really appreciate that. What's the longest you've ever stayed in a single hotel room? Oh, uh, in Albuquerque. I mean, I, when I, we shot the pilot, I stayed in a hotel room for six weeks. The same room. Yeah. Yeah. You start to the, the walls start to come in a little bit, right? I was I a went little to little bit. It was rough. right when Grayland started. I went to England to do a piece about the Champions League final, and I didn't really understand London geography at the time, so I just asked to be to stay somewhere close to Wembley Stadium, and Wembley Stadium is not close to London, so I was in this like Marriott essentially next to Wembley, but Wembley, when there is not a football match on, is essentially like a parking lot with three weird bars and like a couple of takeout places. And it's that it's not, it does not feel like you were in London, but I was in the same hotel room for like six nights, I think. And on like night five, you just start to lose it a little bit. So Ava having a bra bucket and also a bra matcha bucket. station, <laughs> I really enjoyed I mean, the relationship one develops with the staff of a hotel and like, it's just, I don't, I did not love that experience, but shouts to Hotel Chaco. They were because nice you also, me. there's certain things that you want to keep like really clean and orderly and like efficient, but then there's the other stuff where you're just like, I'm just going to put my towels on the floor like that. Well, yes, but also, you know, I don't know. I mean, are you an unpacker? Like there are people if I'm staying and I'm trying somewhere to for, be, if I'm staying somewhere for longer than two days, I will, I will mostly unpack. Yeah. Yes. And I, I think it's actually but good I have psychologically a lot of garments to that do it. need to be hung, you know, <laughs> like, of, of course, of course, I don't want to step on that, but I just mean that there's, there's still a part of me that carries over. Maybe this is a younger person's mentality, but a hotel room means you don't have to do that. Yeah. A hotel room means you can just have a part of your suitcase that's clean t-shirts and a part of your suitcase. That's just miscellany. And like, we'll see how it works out. And so the backsliding that would occur one week in, two weeks in was intense. Let me circle back to your question. For me, the most interesting thing, dynamic going forward on hacks, especially now that the creators have had a moment to kind of like take it in, hopefully reflect, see what they've been able to accomplish, is that the desire to push forward with a lot of plot and tension and this will they or won't they, in this case, stay together, not romantically, but professionally relationship that is the core of the show you know, there, as you said, they burn through a lot, but there's still a bunch to burn, uh, a lot of kindling thrown on at the very end. 
There's also the fact that this is an absolutely delightful hang and could be for like Showtime series length. Like this could go seven seasons and I would yeah. be delighted. It's just so purely warm and funny and I enjoy being with these people and I'd love to see these ladies laughing about everything forever. Are those two realities in some form of, of tension with each other? And was it a surprise to Downs and Aniello and Statsky, the creators of the show, that they kind of entered into that Parks and Rec zone six episodes in where this could be a highly successful gentle or gentler show that doesn't need to have these dramatic plot swings. They certainly have their options open because you've got the Marcus plot line. You've got somebody as notable as Caitlin Olsen, who I feel like is reprising her Curb Your Enthusiasm character, but is still delightful on this show. I mean, hell, you still got like Christopher McDonald and who's a Lauren Weedman who plays the the mayor who... The great Lauren Weedman of Briarpatch fame. A brilliant performer. So happy to see her. Yeah. So you've got like real hitters up and down the lineup and you're kind of like, huh, like, could you, could you just do a spinoff about the Palmetto and just yes. a, about like this weird Steve Wynn-esque character and his and the mayor and like all, all these people in and around Vegas? Part of my, the reason why I'm saying this is because I think ultimately why I was so dazzled by the show was the enormous opportunity that the creators and writers had to do really deep hitting emotional storytelling with phenomenal scene work and great dialogue and take every opportunity given. Like every time something comes up, every time there's some tension, right? Like if you just jump to the finale, all of a sudden it comes spilling out in the green room that Ava was, you know, interviewing. Now she has to go home because of her dad, et cetera, et cetera. And you can feel like that. that's, you can tell, you know, we've been watching the show. We know it's the finale. It's a go get your popcorn moment. Sure. And then the scene delivers. Yeah. In a, you know, within an economy of lines, everything that needs to be said, everything that makes sense. And I know that's a weird way to phrase it, but we know these characters now as an audience, and certainly they know them even better. They say the right things in that time. And they took that opportunity. And maybe this is coming off of, you know, the last few years of dramatic storytelling on TV. And also, you know, full disclosure, my last year of writing drama pilots, the opportunity to just get that and hit it is lessened now, I think, when a drama pilot has to deliver so much other stuff, namely plot, but also just the machinery of something big and epic enough even to be made. Yeah. And it's pushing the other stuff out to the margins or maybe pushing it to future episodes. And I'm watching Hacks and I'm like, this is actually a hack. They have hacked the prestige television mainframe of how to tell the types of stories I want to see. And they found such a delightful delivery system to do it. And my favorite part about the finale is just how when they when Deborah shows up to Ava's father's funeral, the, to the wake, and she does her routine where she saves the sort of the ceremony or you know the, the, the gathering because nobody is getting up to talk about uh, her father. And Deborah goes up and just does like a tight five. It's that part that it's like they can teach each other something because Ava is like, well, comedy's job is to speak truth to power and comedy's job is to always be honest and comedy's job is to reveal and all this stuff. And Deborah's like, maybe, but comedy's job is also to entertain. Comedy's job is also to, you know, make people feel a little bit less alone or make people laugh and all these things. And you can see that dynamic at play in such a, like a deeply personal moment. I guess my one thing I will say... And, and, before and we... Just to say, that's TV. You just described yeah, TV. Same right. thing. I would say, I hope that we we can ask the the creators or we could just wait but like i hope that in the beginning of the second season they just like brush aside the like cliffhanger of the first season yeah i i got to say i don't i trust them so my opinion doesn't matter but i i'm not motivated like that it felt to me a little bit like the kind of thing you throw in when you're you have a bubble show and you want to have something to argue for you know like well you can't cancel us People want to know about the email. Yeah, right. Um, right. That that's belittling what they did. It's obviously a track that they had previously laid, and and it, and it speaks to the nature of these characters and, and you probably general trustworthiness, et cetera, et cetera. Don't bring but, in the performers that you get for you know Chris Gear and you know like you probably don't bring those people on and just be like it's just one episode. Don't worry. Like you'd probably want them. Kirby to be, Howell Baptiste too. Like, yeah, right. Like Hollywood's go-to funny Brits. Yeah. Um, that said, I, I think you bring them in because they're a veil to do this as a favor. They definitely under, un, are under no contractual obligation to continue with this show. Sure. Although right. the way things work now, like I, especially well, Chris Gear's getting here. this is us money now. So he's good. Yeah, he's, he's like, this is them now. He's doing fine. Uh, I, 
the only bump I had in the finale, which I thought was otherwise just fantastic, was there was a moment when she gets the call. Ava gets a call that her father's had another stroke. And then she goes home and her mother, played by the always great Jane Addams, is like unraveling, trying to cancel the baseball package. And she's like, because he'll never watch TV again. And I was like, oh, we're finding out that he died. Right. But I guess Ava knew that he died because she never reacts in a surprising way to it. And so I was a little confused about the, the TikTok timeline of that, but it did pay off for me because it led to one of the most, uh, if I may cite this one more time, a uh, Leo meme of sociopathy <laughs> ever seen on television where a character is unmoved by the death of a loved one, but when a mentor says that she's a good writer, begins to weep. Yes, I, that, <laughs> you get that. I kind of felt that in my bones. Do you, you know, so obviously Hacks concludes its first season and and it's quote unquote in its place. I mean, it's it's, not necessarily like a one for one replacement is the second season of Betty on HBO and HBO Max. Did you want to say anything about that now or do you want to wait till like Thursday to chat about it? Well, I think we can get more into it. I haven't it, got a chance to, to that, see the first episode yet. So that's your morning show trailer, is what you're saying. Yeah, right. and, and we all respect it. But just that it's well, up in Betty season two. His spirit of like insouciance and like taking chances, I think definitely was one of the main inspirations for the show. But he's personally not in it, as far as I can tell. I think people have heard me say this week after week. I adored Betty season one, one of the great surprises of 2020 on TV, um, available for your streaming pleasure now. Such a great vibe, such a great hang. I think HBO knows what it has here. Um, I hadn't realized this, but new episodes drop like Friday nights at 11, which is probably prime time for a show like this. And um, only seen one of the the new season's episodes. So far, I would def I, I have two things, and I'll just leave it. I'll leave it at this because I hopefully people will catch up. We'll watch more episodes. We'll have more answers, and I'm curious your take on it. But one is, so far, it definitely feels vibier. Probably more like Crystal Moselle's videos that she did that were the original documentary Skate Kitchen. I don't really feel any hand of structure like to make this in any way traditional. Like every so often, a, a plot line will start to bubble, and then we'll just have like 45 seconds of people just you know dancing and waving glow sticks in Washington Square Park. Which, by the way, fine. Um, it's a COVID show, which mm -hmm. I it makes sense, but I was still a little taken aback by. And I'm very curious how people react to this, because when I say a COVID show, obviously they filmed it in New York during this pandemic, which you know, still isn't over. But the characters are living with its realities in a way where they're like they have masks around their necks most of the time. And then sometimes they do scenes wearing masks. And I'm curious if other people had this reaction. This is not a quality comment on the show. This is my personal reaction to it, which was, I wish they, I wish it wasn't. Mm -hmm. I wish it wasn't because unless it's a thing, like, and I, again, I don't want the skaters of Betty to contract COVID. That's not what I'm saying. Right. It's just like I, their voices are muffled and I can't see their faces. So let's just, let's just pretend. I wish they had just pretended unless it becomes more of a thing that keeps them from being able to live their free lives. But so far it isn't, doesn't really seem to. There's a skate ramp scene in the pilot where characters are exhibiting behavior that I don't even think we're allowed to consider until tomorrow in Los Angeles. <laughs> um, and I'm still not ready to. Uh, so that that kind of threw me. Um, and I'm curious if other people have that. And I, and, and I obviously, I'm going to keep watching. I love the show and I hope it runs for a million seasons. But I'm wondering if other people have their reaction to it or to other COVID-related content. Yeah, we've talked about this a little bit about whether or not is it healthy to want to move on from it on on our screens, like, and to not want to have a sort of grapple with, like, oh, it's, it's stand six feet and let's have a wide shot of us? I understand, that, like, there's different different takes on that. I'll, I'll be interested to check out Betty and, and and report back. And also, I don't want to step on anything because Chris Chris knows that I love the element of surprise, but it almost sounds like we're going to have more to say about hacks with guests this week. It feels like it. That's right. That's it right. It feels like something else could be dropping this week, but I don't want to say anymore. It just well, seems and, like so. We'll probably like, have like a very busy Thursday night show. So we'll have Loki, we'll have Top Chef, and we'll have probably some hacks content. Guess what? Kai is on vacation. She doesn't even know this yet. Maybe we just drop that separate. Maybe we just. Keep oh, you want to just do like a hundred episodes this week? Yeah. All right. We'll Let's do it. do it. Let's flood the zone with our content. People love it. Today, speaking of Kaya's absence, we were produced by Richie Bozak, my boy. So Richie, uh, thank you so much for producing us. Uh, and Andy and I will be back on Thursday. 